Happy October. It's Halloween month, the time when all of Games YouTube decides to all cover spooky games for an entire month. That's lucky for me, since all my current creative projects are frustratingly stalled. I could use a change of pace, and I need to put something out so you all, YouTube, and I don't collectively agree that I'm a hack who should stop producing videos. But what would I play? It would have to be something fast. Intense. And just a little spooky. Now we're talking. Distance is a racing game from indie devs Refract Studios. You might be rightly asking how a spooky racing game can exist. Part of the answer is that calling Distance a racing game feels inadequate. Sure, you drive a car and you can race against ghosts or other players, but the jumping, flying, and deadly obstacles make it less a race in the traditional sense and more a race against a clock that wants you dead. The main campaign takes place in The Array, a sci-fi space city where something has gone wrong and only you can stop it. I know that's a particularly vague synopsis. This is one of those games that's hard to show off because the coolest stuff is stuff that I want you to experience for yourself. I am excited to talk about the presentation, so let's go for a drive down an evil neon highway. This game has its roots planted in another. Nitronic Rush is a racing game from indie devs Team Nitronic. Wait, did I say that already? Team Nitronic was a group of 11 students at the DigiPen Institute who got together and made a survival driving game set in a bright neon city of the future. You can find it on the DigiPen site, and it's well worth the free it'll cost you. Seven of the 11 members of the Nitronic Rush team went on to work on Distance, and it shows by being a huge refinement of the former. Models and textures look good, particularly the player car and roads. It's clear that the attention was on the elements that the player would be focusing on the most. Buildings can look a bit plain, but you should be going too fast to care, and most of the time it's hidden by brilliant use of color. Each level has a couple of key colors, which does a few different things. First, it's visually interesting, and stays that way by mixing up color schemes. This is one of those games that turns heads with just a trailer or a screenshot. I know, because it worked on me. Second, it serves the gameplay purpose by lighting up incoming hazards and track changes. Third, since color palettes are varied but consistent in their use, they're used to make you feel a certain way. The start of the game immerses you in a cityscape of blues and greens, so when you start to see reds and oranges, you're on edge and paying attention. Same thing when there's no color. Since bright colors are the norm, it's unsettling when they're gone. Changes in color and lighting are a big part of how the game builds tension. It's a common trope, but I'd argue it works well here. The same thing can be said about sound, and Distance has a similar relationship with its audio. Like the visuals, the music influences mood with an electronic score that ranges from moody ambiance to synthwave to a high-energy drum and bass sound. The soundtrack for this game is two and a half hours of original music, and the naming scheme suggests that the original campaign had tracks scored with each level in mind. This means there's a real synergy between visual, sound, and gameplay. It's that notion of, it just feels right. Overall, the presentation is great, and the stylized, neon, cyberpunk city look is fantastic. More natural environments don't look as good, but those levels are fairly rare. There are way more hits than misses here. So it looks and sounds good, but how does it play? Distance is easy to learn and hard to master. The controls are fairly simple. I play with a gamepad, but you could probably get it working on just about anything. The basics are steering with the left stick and gas and brake on the triggers. That leaves with four abilities, boost, jump, deployable wings, and grip thrusters. On their own, each of these is pretty straightforward. Boost makes you go fast, jump makes you go up, wings make you stay up, and grip makes you stay down. What makes it interesting is how these abilities combine with each other and the track. 
The jump and wings are useful for crossing large gaps, but can also be used to find shortcuts and secrets. Grip is used to cling to the road, but can also be used to switch to new sections, short hop, or even fly if you know what you're doing. These abilities are necessary to survive each track, thanks to hazards like saw blades, lasers, and crushers. Lasers and saws are the most interesting since they're not instant death and checkpoints repair you. Having the option to try and hit the next checkpoint on half a car is great. It makes recovering from a mistake almost as satisfying as not making it, and even if you can't save it, the respawns are quick and forgiving. Most tracks nail the sense of speed, and there's a wide range of challenge. Many are forgiving, but the extreme is a nightmarish test of reaction time, pattern recognition, and understanding of the mechanics. Skill here is less about driving fast, and more understanding how to prepare for the next hazard or road change, or telling roads to shove it and taking a secret path or shortcut. Let this be a lesson. It's good that we don't have flying cars, because some boner would try to fly theirs upside down and crash into a building trying to do a sick skip. There are three campaigns, the full-length adventure and two mini-campaigns unlocked by finishing it. The adventure campaign is the longest at 15 levels, but doesn't overstay its welcome. A blind first run can come in under two hours, and playing it for this video I finished in under an hour. I'm not gonna say the P word for fear of what I might unleash in the comments, but more games could take notes from this and others on how to keep it short and sweet. There's a lot of environmental storytelling here, with information gleaned from displays in the world and PA broadcasts as you race through each level. They're good world building, and the devs knew better than to kill the pacing by turning them into info dumps. You can stop and listen if you want, but they're designed so you get the point while zooming by at full speed. All this is used to flesh out the world, build stakes, and create an atmosphere of dread and terror. Did you forget this is a spooky October game? Spooky time is spoiler time, so you can skip to here for the next campaign. Seeing this online was the moment that sold me on this game. I don't think the release is satisfying compared to the build-up, but that is some great build. The campaign takes place on the Array, a colony established in space above Earth. You're led to believe that those on the Array have escaped a ravaged planet and created an enclave of science to go beyond and avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. Armed with the knowledge that a video game is going to happen, it shouldn't come as a surprise that something has gone horribly wrong. You start with a goal and a timer, and race across your radio your destination, and from the beginning there's a slow building tension. The starting sector looks fine, but holographic signs are calling for evacuation. A red marker on a map of the array shows something's amiss, and you're headed right for it. The second level provides a first glimpse of the antagonist. It goes unnamed, and that's a good call. This thing is spooky and makes me hallucinate my own death. I don't need to know its name to know it's bad news. It's a slow burn after that tease, as you don't see the enemy again until a third of the way through the game. That might sound like a lot, but a third of the game is about 20 minutes, and the lead-up is spent foreshadowing it with increasingly literal warning signs. The climax of this build-up is the spooky horror tunnel I showed you earlier. It's the best scare in the game, and also marks a shift from atmospheric horror to survival driving. Until now, nothing has been very hard. It's the tutorial campaign, so it has to ease you in. Most hazards so far have been malfunctioning road equipment. After the game does you a heckin' scare, it starts to get harder. The hazards are mostly the same, but they're more aggressively placed. We've gone from OSHA violations to attempted murder, and the smartest thing the game does is have the deadliest hazards placed in areas infected by the enemy. The game is harder because the enemy is literally altering the environment to be more hostile to you. It's a bit of ludonarrative cohesion as smart as it is subtle, since I thought, oh shit, that's clever, when I realized it on my fifth run of the game. Your joyride continues through the campaign's best levels, leading up to a final confrontation, which is a hallucination or battle of the mind or what have you. I'm okay with this, since it allows for nightmarish abstract imagery and avoids a literal boss fight that probably wouldn't have fit the gameplay. You win, jump through the open teleporter, and wind up on an earth that seems to be 
doing okay. I thought the whole point of the distance project was escaping a ravaged planet. This is speculation, so it's entirely possible I'll be outed as a dumbass, but the implication that the game was a test calls into question what actual threat the enemy posed. It claims to want to escape from this loop, but since the loop before your run ended in failure, didn't that already happen? Or is the threat of the enemy as illusory as the city you drove through? The ending is painted with such broad strokes that I'm left with more questions than answers. They didn't stick the landing, but when the ride was this good, it's hard to stay upset for long. Lost to Echoes and Nexus are the mini-campaigns unlocked after finishing Adventure Mode. They're harder, but even shorter. Lost to Echoes took me about 30 minutes, despite making more mistakes, and I was in and out of Nexus in 10 minutes. Echoes is a nostalgia trip for anyone who played Nitronic Rush, returning to that city after the events of the game. The visuals are higher fidelity, but in that game's style. I prefer the art style of Adventure, but it's cool to see the difference. There are great set pieces in the second half of the campaign, and secrets abound for the curious, with the rewards including the Nitronic Rush car and something special for the worthy. Nexus unlocks after completing the Echoes campaign and feels very experimental. There's almost no narrative, with a focus on a new art style and new challenges. If you blew through the main campaign and thought it was too easy, this might give you what you're after. The campaigns succeed at what they set out to do, deliver exciting gameplay in short, stylized packages. I think Adventure Mode could have afforded to turn up the heat a little faster, but if you're itching for a challenge, you'll find it in Arcade Mode. There are 76 levels for Sprint Mode, not counting campaign tracks, and they get much harder. These are both in-house maps and levels curated from the community. In Distance, Hell is other people's courses. The game shipped with a level editor, and the community has gone on to make a ridiculous amount of custom courses. There are tracks favoring style over challenge, as well as sadistic death traps. There are levels that try to fit in alongside the campaign, those that do their own thing, and those that opt for nostalgia that's almost certainly copyright infringing. There's a lot of creativity on display, as some of my favorite levels in the game are actually workshop maps. I'll list some in the credits, so make sure to watch to the end, but here's a taste. This is a fan map. Somebody made this in their free time. I haven't played anything that's a drastic reinvention of the core loop, aside from maybe the desert bus level. Please don't play the desert bus level, it's literally just six minutes of this. Regardless, if you're hooked on the game's core loop, there is a ridiculous amount of content available. A stunt mode and random track generator round out the offerings here. Stunt mode isn't really my thing, but these add to the already impressive pile of content, and it doesn't really hurt if you're not interested. So that's distance. It's a short, sweet throw ride that can become remarkably content-rich if you fall down the rabbit hole of customs. I may never reach the bottom of that well, but I enjoyed what I played, and I adore the style of the game. Every time I play, I keep thinking about the music and visuals, even after I've moved on. It remains to be seen what comes next from Refract, but after this game, I'll absolutely be watching out for whatever the next project is. <laughs> Okay, so where the hell have I been, right? I ran into some hurdles with what was supposed to be my latest video that have it stuck in the mud. Turns out promising a video on a game you have nostalgia goggles on for is a bad idea. It might come, it might not. I don't want to promise anything when overcommitting to a promise tanked my output last time. As I get back into the swing of things, I want to do something to celebrate hitting 500 subscribers. I'm thinking a spooky Halloween night stream. If that's something you're interested in, join the Discord through the link in the description and let me know what date and what game you'd be interested in seeing. Thank you so much to everyone who's subscribed and who's stuck with me during this content drought. I'm so grateful and I can't wait to put out something new for you soon. Thanks again for watching and have a great day.